And when evening had come, since it was the day of preparation, that is the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who was also himself looking for the kingdom of God, took courage and went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate was surprised to hear that he should have already died. And summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he was already dead. And when he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the corpse to Joseph. And Joseph bought a linen shroud, and taking him down, wrapped him in the linen shroud, and laid him in a tomb that had been cut out of the rock. And he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Amen. You may be seated. This morning, before we actually dive into the body of the text, I just have one order of business I want to deal with. Um, If you've been tracking with us since January, you know that we have been in the book of Mark uh, all year, and today is the last day of the Mark series. So give yourselves a hand. You made it. You did it. Woo! Uh, If you've been here every week, you just read a whole book of the Bible. That's that's pretty exciting. Uh, But if you are a student of the Word, Uh, And maybe even if you have a Bible there sitting in front of you, you will notice that we stopped our reading today at verse 8. And uh, you may have a Bible that stops at verse 8. You may have a Bible that stops uh, at verse 20. And so what I wanted to do is just kind of explain to you why we're stopping at verse 8. In uh, in the Bible, there are a few places where some of the early manuscripts are a little fuzzy. Uh, None of the places from history where we have fuzzy manuscript evidence. None of those places do any of the doctrines of our faith actually rest. And so what I want to do is I just want to briefly give you three reasons uh, why we're stopping at verse 8, and I want to give you a few reasons why here at Palmetto Shores Church we fully and completely trust the Bible as the authoritative Word of God. So real quick, here's three reasons why we're stopping at verse 8. The first is that the earliest manuscripts that we have do not contain the rest of the verses. In fact, in, if you're holding the ESV in front of you or maybe another translation, uh, it actually says that in, in, right underneath verse 8, it says some of the earliest manuscripts do not contain 16, 9 to 20. Uh, the second reason is that the abruptness to the ending of r- verse 8 actually matches the style of Mark. If you've been tracking with us, uh, this journey through Mark has kind of felt like we were on a, a traveling carnival ride, right? It's been bumpy, it's been jerky, it's been, it's been fast-paced. Uh, Mark gave us no account of the birth of Jesus. Uh, he gave us, like John, he didn't give us some sort of theological prologue to, to the ministry of Jesus. Mark jumped straight in at the baptism, and it's just been a, a fast-paced move through the, through the whole book of Mark. And so the abrupt ending actually makes sense for his style. And then third and finally, the, the ending in verse 8 uh, throws the emphasis off of the characters in the story and on to the readers and the listeners of the story like us, that Mark intentionally leaves us with a cliffhanger so that it draws us into the story. We are left uh, being the ones who have to to answer for what we've heard throughout the Gospel of Mark. But now quickly, I want to give you a few reasons why we trust the Bible here at Palmetto Shores Church. First, uh, we trust the Bible because the Bible says about itself that it's trustworthy. Uh, The second reason is that the Bible in no place contradicts 
itself or creates unresolvable tensions, even though it spans thousands of years of history. It was written in multiple languages, uh, and under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, it is authored by dozens of authors. And for that many people to come together over that amount of time and create a one book that is cohesive, uh, that has no contradictions, is only an act of God. Uh, Third, the Bible has triumphed in people's lives for thousands of years, dealing with both the proud and the humble. Uh, It has radically changed societies, governments, and nations. Fourth, there is a mountain of historical evidence that corroborates all the historical details that we find in the Bible. And fifth, and most importantly, we trust the Bible because we trust God. God does not make mistakes, and whatever He produces is perfect. Uh, I've printed out a handful of of copies of an article on why we trust the Bible. It's by a guy named Greg Gilbert. It's right up here at the front of the stage. If after the service you have questions about the Bible, about why we trust it, uh, or about why why we stake our whole lives upon it, I would encourage you to come up, grab an article. I would love to have a conversation with you. Uh, We believe here that based on the faithfulness of God and, and based on His faithfulness throughout history, Uh, That This Bible that we're holding, that we're reading this morning, is His authoritative word to us, and we're willing to stake our whole church and our whole lives upon it. So I'm going to read, or excuse me, I'm going to pray, and then we're going to dive into the text this morning, and we're going to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. So let's pray together. Lord God, we praise you as the God who's faithful, faithful to speak, faithful to God our lives, and faithful to raise your Son up from the dead. We worship you this morning. We've already been singing uh, to you, worshiping you, praising you, thanking you for the freedom, for the salvation that we have in Christ. God, I pray and I ask this morning that you would set our gaze upon him, that you would fix our hearts upon Jesus, that we would actually take a legitimate step forward in trusting you, a legitimate step forward in being more faithful to you and to your mission that you've given us as a church. God, we know we come in here this morning with, uh, we, we come in here with our sins, we come in here with our failures, we come in here with probably uh, th- thoughts about the plans that we have later today, but God, in this moment, we declare that we are here for you. We are here because we want to know you more, and because we long more than anything to be conformed to the image of your Son, and so come now by the power of your Spirit and move mightily among us. It's in Jesus' name that we pray and worship. Amen. Remember Jesus Christ risen from the dead. Remember Jesus Christ risen from the dead. That is what the dying apostle Paul wrote to his young son in the faith, Timothy. Now, why would Paul need to write to Timothy and say, remember Jesus Christ risen from the dead. Isn't that unforgettable? Isn't Jesus risen from the dead something that if it's true, it it would radically, completely upend and change our whole lives? See, Paul wasn't reminding Timothy about the historical fact of the resurrection. Timothy hadn't forgot. Paul was encouraging Timothy to live as if the resurrection of Jesus actually mattered. And that's what I think leads us, this is my opinion, to the most important question in the universe. What difference does the resurrection of Jesus make? What difference does the resurrection of Jesus make? Well, to answer that question, I think we have to acknowledge something that's wrong with the world. Uh, if you really boil it down, all of our anxieties and worries in this life really, really come down to one thing. That for all of us, we know that life is precious. And yet for all of us, we know that we are going to die. We are going to die. And the ones that we love most are going to die. And the shadow of death, the dark shadow of death, casts a shadow over all of our lives. And while certainly it is the actual fear of dying itself that is scary, uh, the the, the dark shadow of death is much more than just the fear of dying. It's the fear of what we'll miss out on. It's the fear of how we'll be remembered. It's the the nagging fear that, that maybe our lives are actually meaningless. 
Sure, we, we fear actually dying, but it's a lot more about the pain of loss. It's a lot more about the anxiety of what we might miss out on when we die. The sense that time is running out and it's running out fast. Uh, this was an article, I'm going to read an excerpt from an article that was written in April of last year. So this is April 2020. And the time span that this is covering, when I read these details, the time span that this is covering is middle of February 2020 to middle of March 2020. Now just try to remember what life was like for you. Think back last year, 2020, fe- middle of February to middle of March. This is what the article says. It says, our research research shows that the number of prescriptions filled per week for antidepressant, anti-anxiety, and anti-insomnia medications increased 21%, peaking the week ending March 15th when COVID-19 was declared a pandemic. The greatest increase was in prescriptions for anti-anxiety medications, which rose 34.1%. More than three quarters, this is 78% of all antidepressant, anti-anxiety, and anti-insomnia prescriptions filled during the week ending March 15th were for new prescriptions. Now, I want to be clear. I'm not making a value judgment about taking these medications. In fact, I'm very thankful to God that we have people who are smart and who help us. And so if you're someone who's taking medications, please continue to take your medication. That's not not what I'm trying to say. What I am trying to say is that the shadow of death looms large in our heads and in our hearts. When we feel like life is slipping out of our grips, we lose our wits, we lose our sleep, we lose our joy. There's never been a time in history when people were more anxious, more stressed, and more depressed. And that is why there has never been a time in history when it has been more important to answer the question, what difference does the resurrection of Jesus actually make? Right? We are people of the resurrection, but let's honestly ask ourselves, has the resurrection of Jesus actually made a difference in our lives? Can we honestly say over the last year and a half that the decisive mood in our hearts has been abundant life and not the fear of death? So we're going to look at four things that the resurrection means today. The first question we want to ask is, what does the resurrection mean in relation to the world? And so first, the resurrection means hope for the world. The resurrection means hope for for the world. As I reread verses 42 through 47, I want you to see how morbid these verses are. That Mark is intentionally uh, drawing our attention to the fact that Jesus really died. That the that the son of God died a real human death. Let's read the let's read it again. And when evening had come, since it was the day of preparation, that is the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who was also himself looking for the kingdom of God, took courage and went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate was surprised to hear that he should have already died. And summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he was already dead. And when he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the corpse to Joseph And Joseph bought a linen shroud, and taking him down, wrapped him in the linen shroud, and laid him in a tomb that had been cut out of the rock. And he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. Notice the emphasis on the fact that Jesus experienced death. Whatever it means for a human being to die, that is exactly what happened to Jesus. Uh, Notice in verse 45 that specifically when Pilate talks about the body of Jesus, he calls it a corpse. And that Pilate being surprised that since the crucifixion usually took much longer, 
he actually reached out to a certified witness, this centurion, who came and told him that, yes, Jesus really did die. So just think for a moment about the world that we live in. A world where terror can be weaponized. Where the fear of potentially dying is is used to create anxiety to control people. This is a world where, like last week, in the middle of the night, a building collapsed in Florida and 150-something people are dead or missing. This is a world where good people get in car accidents and have heart attacks and battle with cancer. This is a a world where the life expectancy is about 77 years. You're born, you grow up, graduate school, maybe go to college, get a job, start a family, maybe live to see a few grandkids, and then that's it. Tsunamis, earthquakes, shootings, freak accidents, disease... Death is always right there, and it's always right around the corner. There is no escaping it. This is the certain future that awaits us all. It haunts us. It drives us. It causes the deepest pain and loss and the deepest anxiety at the threat of loss. So if this is the reality of the situation, why is my first point hope for the world? How can we have hope in the valley of the shadow of death? Well, it's because when Jesus rose from the dead, he arose from our death. Jesus didn't just get up from a nap. Jesus didn't just phase in and out of consciousness. Jesus really died the same human death that every single person in this room will die. Without the resurrection of Jesus, death would own us. It would be final. It would be the end of the story. But Mark wants us to see very specifically that Jesus became a corpse. And it wasn't the end of the story for him. So that when you and I are faced with the cold, hard reality that we will also become a corpse, we can know that it is not the end of our story. Death is not the victor. Death is not final. Death is not the end of the story. Right, Mark chapter 15 was brutal, but there is a Mark chapter 16. The resurrection means hope for the world. So what does a hope-filled life look like? A hope-filled life is cheerfully defiant when all the circumstances around us tell us that we should be anxiously defeated. A hope-filled life is realistically optimistic, knowing that none of us are immune to pain or loss or even death, but that by faith, by faith in the promise, we know that God has told us on the certainty of the resurrection of His Son that He will bend all of our deepest sorrows and fears into our greatest good, So I want you to consider for a second, consider the end of your life. You may think that you know when that's going to be, but consider the end. When you get to the end, what will your hope be anchored to? Will your hope be anchored to wishful thinking? Or will your hope be sure because it is anchored to the resurrection of Jesus the, the, the risen Christ who conquered death, our death, that we deserve. So, when, when you get to that day, when you're sick and you're dying, or when someone you love is sick and dying, when your body is failing, remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead. Now we're going to move to consider what the resurrection means in relation to God. And so second, the resurrection means satisfaction for God. The resurrection means satisfaction for God. As chapter 16 opens up, we observe the same three ladies who were standing at a distance at the crucifixion of Jesus. Uh, Three days have gone by and two nights, and now they've come early on Sunday morning, the first day of the week, to prepare and bury the body of Jesus uh, properly. And that's where we're going to pick up in verse 1. 
It says, when Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. So to their great surprise, they go to the tomb where they expect to see Jesus and the stone is rolled away. The tomb is empty. The crucified Jesus is no longer in the tomb. If we're going to understand the significance of the empty tomb, we have to remember why it is that Jesus died in the first place. Right? This is the gospel. This is the good news that God made this world and he made it uh, good and he put us in it so that we would know him and love him and worship him. But every single one of us has turned away from God. We turned our back on him. But rather than just wipe us out, rather than just uh, execute the, the curse to the fullest extent, he sent his son on a rescue mission. And Jesus came into the world and he lived a perfect life. And as we saw last week, he died a gruesome death. We saw that, that when Jesus was hanging on the cross and darkness covered the whole land in the middle of the afternoon, Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because the anger of God towards our sin, the punishment that our sin deserved, was being poured out upon Jesus. That sin deserves death. And Jesus, as our substitute, was dying the death that we deserved. He was dying in our place. So what significance is there in the fact that the women found the stone rolled away? Well, the empty tomb is proof that God accepted the sacrifice. The empty tomb is proof that the work of redemption is done, that the debt has been fully paid, that the work that God had given his son to do had been completely fulfilled. When we talk about God being satisfied in this sense, what we mean is that his standard, his perfection, his justice has been fulfilled in his son, Jesus Christ. Uh, Lately, uh, there have been a lot of graduations, right? Maybe some of you guys have graduated or you've been to graduations. You've seen people celebrating graduations. Some people take the the diploma and the graduation, you know, pretty serious, and and as they should. Uh, the, the, The graduation and the diploma is the school's way of saying, this person met the requirements. This person fulfilled what we asked of them. This person has satisfied the high standard that we set to graduate from this school. It is like a a public declaration. Like, you know, when you graduate, all the work's been turned in. You've you've written all your essays. You've uh, turned in all your final exams. You might even know what all your grades already are. But on the day when you walk across the stage and you're handed that diploma, that is the school saying, the work is done, it is finished, and it is satisfactory. Well, that is what the empty tomb represents. The empty tomb is the signal to the world that redemption is done, that the debt is paid, that Jesus has done it all and he's done it all for us, that there will never be any more payment asked because Jesus took that cup of wrath, he tipped it back, and he drank every single last drop. So the resurrection means satisfaction for God. What does that mean for me? What does that mean for you? Guys, this is really good news. The empty tomb means that the sins of my past that come back to haunt me, they got left in the grave. And it means as I'm living my life and I'm struggling forward and I I come to this realization over and over and over again that I could try as hard as I possibly could and it would never be enough. The empty tomb tells me that there is a diploma of approval hanging above my head because my Savior has done everything necessary 
for me to have life and life abundant in relationship with God. The empty tomb means that when we mess up and we feel the need to beat ourselves up and the sense that we have to somehow make sacrifices back to God, all that is done forever. Jesus paid it all. His work is done and the, and, and the Father God has said yes. He sent an angel that Sunday morning to roll away the tomb and when he sent that angel down, it was his amen to the finished work of Jesus Christ for our redemption. So when the sins of your past come back to haunt you and you realize over and over and over again that for all your efforts it would never be enough, remember Jesus Christ risen from the dead. Now third, we're going to turn to consider specifically what the resurrection means for Jesus. And so third, the resurrection means vindication for Jesus. The resurrection means vindication for Jesus. After arriving at the tomb, only to find the stone rolled away, the women then greet a messenger who delivers the best news that the world has ever heard. I want to read verses 5 through 7 again. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe. And they were alarmed. And he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him, but go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Who of us wouldn't be just like these women? That if we showed up to that 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 tomb that morning, that we just wouldn't be totally alarmed. If we had watched Jesus be put on trial and and slapped, and the beard pulled out of his face, and spit upon, and mocked, and ridiculed, and beaten, and scourged, and then crucified. If we had seen how the darkness came over the land, if we had seen how he had cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? If we had seen Jesus take his last breath, and then watched them put his body in the tomb, and seal it with the stone, who of us showing up that morning wouldn't be shocked with astonishment, amazement, with wonder, just like these women. Death had swallowed Jesus whole, and and it wasn't just a normal death. Jesus didn't just pass off in his sleep. Jesus had been publicly executed as a criminal. The whole world had gathered up to publicly crucify Jesus. Uh, I'm sure some of you are familiar with the name Richard Jewell. Uh, Jewell is the man who was accused of the Atlanta bombings at the 1996 Olympics. I recently watched the film series Manhunt Deadly Games, uh, where you're taken on this journey with Jewel, as for a few months of his life, his whole world was completely ripped apart. Uh, He was hounded by the media. He was uh, publicly crucified. When Allie and I watched it together, we literally were brought to tears because here's a man who was actually a hero, This guy actually saved the day. He saved hundreds of lives, and yet he's being put on trial before the entire world. He couldn't get a job. All his friends deserted him. Everybody in his life left him out to dry. But then my favorite part of the show is when uh, Jewel finally proves mathematically that there was no possible way that he is the one who committed the crime, and he's vindicated Right, The guy who was uh, a hero, who was then publicly executed, was then vindicated as the real hero of the story. When Jesus was being mocked and ridiculed on the cross, he could have come down and proved to them who he was. But the reason he didn't is because he was offering himself up as a sacrifice for our sins. Back in chapter 52, Verse 32, this is what they were saying to Jesus while he was hanging on the cross. They said, let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. They wanted proof. They wanted validation. They wanted him to do a miracle to prove that he really was who he said he was. But Jesus gave us so much more. Rather than showing his power by avoiding death, 
Jesus showed us his power by conquering death. Right? Rather than proving himself by getting himself up, the, up off the cross, Jesus proved himself by getting up out of the grave. Jesus, the crucified one, had risen, and the messenger, that angel that was there at the tomb, he reminded these women that everything that had happened had happened just as Jesus had told them it would happen. Let's read verse 7 again. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he's going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Jesus had over and over and over again predicted that he was going to rise from the dead. So if Jesus had stayed in the ground then he would just be a liar. If Jesus had stayed in the ground, then he would just be one more crazy lunatic. If Jesus had stayed in the ground, there would be absolutely no point for us to put our faith in him. But if Jesus got out of the grave, just as he told them he would, then everything he had told them was validated. Everything he had predicted was true. He truly was the Son of God. He truly was the King of God's kingdom. Jesus truly is the hero of history. The resurrection means vindication for Jesus. So what difference does this make for us? Well, I want us just to pause for a second and remember that the same world that Jesus lived in is the same world that we find ourselves in. And if the the world crucified him, why would we be surprised if the world wanted to crucify those who follow him? Now listen, this is no pity party. Uh, In fact, I actually say this to, to our shame. Why are we freaking out? Why are we acting like Jesus hasn't taught us how to die. Haven't we learned from Jesus that maybe if we find ourselves on the cross, it might be exactly where God wants us to be? And that in His time, that in His way, and that through His resurrection, we will be vindicated with Him also. See, there is no such thing as complaining with Christ. There is no such thing as grumbling with Christ. There is no such thing as self-righteousness with Christ. There is no such thing as defending ourselves with Christ. But if we suffer with Him, we will also reign with Him. If we are mocked with Him, we will also be honored with him. If we are ridiculed with him, we will also be glorified with him. No one in the history of the world has ever been more misunderstood than Jesus. And no one in the history of the world has ever been more publicly and powerfully vindicated than Jesus Christ. So when you feel like you're being misunderstood and misrepresented and falsely accused. When you feel like the whole world has circled around you and no one understands why you think that the most valuable thing in the universe is the glory of God, remember Jesus Christ risen from the dead. So the big question today has been, what difference does the resurrection make? And that's why I believe Mark does end his narrative account in the way that he does. You know, we might be tempted to think, okay, we got the resurrection. Just throw our hands up in the air and coast on to the end. We're all good. Here we go. But that's actually the exact opposite of how God wants us to respond to the resurrection. And so finally, fourth and finally, the resurrection means mission for the church. The resurrection means mission for the church. Uh, in some ways, it, it does kind of feel like an awkward end to the narrative, right? Jesus has just been declared, uh, risen from the dead. He is not here. He is risen. And the women are charged to go and to tell. But then this is how verse 8 ends, the book of Mark. And then they went out and fled from the tomb, 
for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Here's the irony. Uh, If you've been tracking with us through the whole book of Mark, maybe this is something you've noticed. Over and over and over again, Jesus told people not to go and tell after he had performed some miracle or disclosed some truth about himself or the future. Over and over and over again, he said, do not tell anyone. And over and over and over again, they went and told anyways. We've seen that so many times. And yet here at the end of Mark, Jesus finally says, go and tell. But seized by fear, the women do not tell anyone. Huh. And see, that's how Mark throws us as the observers away from just watchers of the characters. And now he invites us into the narrative because we've all been there. We all know it's, it's the weirdest thing. I, I literally believe that a man died and rose from the dead, and I have trouble talking about it. What in the world is that all about? I literally believe that a man conquered death, and yet I get seized by fear. And so, how do we move forward? Well, I love that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, there's a whole 58-verse uh, chapter about the resurrection. Verse after verse after verse, Paul is making an argument telling us why the resurrection of Jesus is an absolute necessity, that it's the most exciting and important thing that's ever happened in the universe. And you'd almost expect that at the end of the chapter, that it would just be a, like a hallelujah, or that it would just be like, okay, guys, The resurrection is true. Stop whining and get on with your lives. But that's not what happens. The last verse of of what, what I might say is the chapter on the resurrection in the Bible. Verse 58 says, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord... Your labor is not in vain. In other words, don't be afraid. Don't stop telling people the story. Put your hope in the fact that if he's risen, then nothing can stop us. If you throw yourself completely into the mission of Jesus, that is the only way, the only way that you can guarantee that your life won't be wasted. The only promise about working and working and working and working and working and it actually having significance is if that work, that work, that work is in the Lord. The resurrection means mission for the church. And so even if we feel scared, even if we feel ill-equipped, even if it feels ridiculous, if Christ is risen, then we have a mission. The resurrection was the end of the mission for Jesus, but it launched the mission of the church. So when you're feeling inadequate, when you're sensing your weakness to complete what Jesus has commissioned us to complete, when you're tempted to allow fear to shut you down, remember Jesus Christ risen from the dead. So what difference does the resurrection of Jesus make in conclusion? What I want to do is just Think about it in the course of history, in the course of how things have played out over these 2,000 years. What was it that empowered Stephen, the first martyr of the church in Acts, to forgive men as they were throwing stones at him, crushing his body until he died? What was it that empowered the Apostle Paul to go back into city after city after city after being stoned and beaten and threatened with death? What is it that has empowered thousands upon thousands over the centuries to offer up their bodies to the flames with a glad song in their mouth and confident hope in their hearts? 
What is it that would cause a young couple to leave the comforts of their home, to go to the remotest parts of the earth, to tell people about Jesus, knowing full well that they more than likely won't die of old age? What could move future son-in-law Adoniram Judson to write this letter to his would-be father-in-law to ask him if he could consent, if he would consent to the marriage of his daughter and subsequent move to a foreign land as a missionary. I want to read this to you. This is what he wrote to his father-in-law. I have now to ask whether you can consent to part with your daughter early next spring to see her no more in this world. Whether you can consent to her departure and her subjection to the hardships and sufferings of a missionary life. Whether you can consent to her exposure to the dangers of the ocean, to the fatal influence of the southern climate of India, to every kind of want and distress, to degradation, insult, persecution, and perhaps a violent death. Can you consent to all this for the sake of him who left his heavenly home and died for her and for you, for the sake of perishing immortal souls, for the sake of Zion and the glory of God? Can you consent to all this? in hope of soon meeting your daughter in the world of glory with the crown of righteousness, brightened with the acclamations of praise, which shall redound to her Savior from heathens saved through her means from eternal woe and despair. And what could empower a father-in-law to say yes and to send her and to never see her again, which is exactly what happened. What difference does the resurrection of Jesus make? It makes all the difference in the world. And it makes all the difference in the world for right now, for how we see the world, for how we set our priorities for how we make decisions. Jesus is risen, and now it's our mission to declare to the world that there is one who's conquered death. There is a king who is a king of life. There is the Son of God who is the Lord of history who has defeated our greatest enemy. And guys, here's the best part. Anybody who's willing to admit they need help who's willing to humble themselves to the point of accepting Jesus as their king, is welcome into the kingdom. Romans 10, 9 says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, what? That God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Why does he say that? Why does Paul attach resurrection to saving faith? Because faith in a risen Savior is not some abstract theoretical thing. Faith in a a resurrected Savior is hope in the face of death. It is freedom while I'm wallowing in the reality of my guilt. It is confidence when all the world around me is accusing me and misunderstanding me and, and falsely telling lies about me. Faith in a risen Savior is seeing that my life actually has purpose even as I carry out the the humdrum mundane of my everyday life. So we are people of the resurrection. We are people who view the world through a different story. Death haunted us. Death owned us. Death had captivity over us. And then Jesus conquered death. He defeated it. He killed it. So, when you are sick and dying, when those sins of the past have come back to haunt you, when you feel misunderstood and misrepresented and feeling like your vindication rests upon your shoulders, when you're afraid to carry out the mission that Jesus has given us, thinking that it's too hard and it's too costly. Remember Jesus Christ, risen 
from the dead. Remember Jesus Christ risen from the dead. Hey, I want you guys to stand up. We're going to sing here and we're going to celebrate, but uh, this is the deal. I, I, I tend to find that I'm actually a lot more like Timothy. I'm the kind of person who, yeah, you know, maybe on paper, maybe if I were to take a theology exam or something, yeah, maybe I would say, I believe Jesus rose from the dead. But then in my actual everyday life, seeing the resurrection of Jesus actually make a difference. Now that's another story. I need to be reminded, not just in a, on a mental level, but on a, a heart level, that there's an empty tomb. <laughs> that death is not the end of the story. There's a risen Savior. So I want to pray over you, and then we're going to sing our heads off. And it's going to be awesome. Lord, we praise you this morning that though Jesus descended all the way down into the depths of all that it means to be dead, he got up from the grave. Lord, I pray resurrection power over this church. Lord, I pray that we would walk with a confidence that the fear of death no longer has power over us. Lord, that our lives are not meaningless. This life is not vanity of vanities, but this life has purpose and meaning that is eternal. Lord, help us to know, not just in our heads, but know in our hearts the resurrection so that it would change the way we live. It would change the way we see the world. It would open up and unlock our lips when we feel afraid. Lord, that we would be excited to share with the world the best news that we've ever heard in our lives. God, this is not natural to us. This is not what we can do in our strength. And so I pray, like the Apostle Paul prayed in Ephesians, that you would open the eyes of our heart to see the hope that we have in Christ, the inheritance of the saints, and the power of the resurrection for those who believe. Lord, Please, we beg you, put the resurrection deep in our hearts that it would make all the difference, not only in the world, but it would make all the difference in us. It's in Jesus' powerful name, the resurrected Savior, that we worship and pray this morning. Amen.